Hello and welcome to this web lecture on the evolution of the integument. So what do we mean when we say the integument? The integument consists of every part of the covering of the body. So this includes obviously the skin as we're seeing here, but all of the structures that either develop within or are derived from the skin. So all kinds of what we call integumentary structures. So this structure, the integument, is going to have a number of different functions, some of them very obvious. It's the covering of the body, so this, it's this barrier between the body and its environment, so it's going to play a lot of roles such as protecting the body from abrasion um, or other kinds of damage from the environment. It's going to protect the body from things like microbial invasions and pathogens, uh, protection from, from UV, uh, sunlight, and those kinds of things that we generally think of our skin as doing. But if we include all of these other integumentary structures and all the different things that the skin can do, we find lots and lots of different kinds of functions. So the colors in the skin can provide camouflage, sometimes in a very dynamic way in the case of things like chameleons that can change their colors to match their background. They can form these extensions and elaborations such as in a sea dragon to, to camouflage the body and make it look like the seagrass that it's hiding in. The colors can also provide warning. So we see warning colorations in these salamanders and this frog here that are basically saying these bright colors mean that I'm poisonous. It's going to communicate to predators to avoid these particular species. They can serve as communication. So here we see a typical mating or aggressive display by an anolis lizard using this extension of the skin. This is called a dewlap that it extends from its neck to communicate. Neck extensions can become very, very elaborate, as in the case of this lizard. Integumentary structures can form things like spines to help to protect the animal, as in the case of this spiny echidna. They can even form locomotory structures. So here is the wing of a bat that's composed primarily of skin that's stretched between these elongated digits. And this is a flying fish that also uses skin to form these wing-like structures from its fins to be able to leap up out of the water and be able to glide significant distances over the surface of the water. So there are lots and lots of things that we can do with this external covering of our bodies. So let's take a look at the composition of the skin itself. So we've already alluded to this idea that the skin is a composite structure composed of tissue that's derived both from ectoderm and also mesoderm. So we've got the epidermis that's derived from that ectodermal covering over the entire uh, surface of the growing embryo. This is going to, the cells are going to proliferate and create this layer of epidermis. And the dermis, as we saw, if we look back at the differentiation of mesoderm, is going to have its origin in this paraxial mesoderm, these rods of tissue that form on either side of the notochord and neural tube. It's going to then condense into these little balls called somites, which are then going to divide into three subdivisions, one of which is the dermatome that's going to migrate out throughout the body and form this inner layer of the skin. So the skin is composed of both ectodermally derived tissue and mesodermally derived tissue, but they're also distinct basic tissue types. So the epidermis is a tissue type called an epithelium. So an epithelium is a layer or sheet of very tightly packed cells. So all of the cells are in very, very close association with one another through tight junctions between the cells. So within the epithelium, we find structures such as glands that you see here, and also often keratinized cells. So keratin is a lipid-rich protein structure that helps to make the skin a little bit tough and also a little bit waterproof. And so, as we'll see as we go on, in land-dwelling vertebrates, this is going to form a layer at the 
surface of the skin called the stratum corneum, which are completely keratinized cells, and we'll talk more about that as we go. The dermis, on the other hand, is a connective tissue. So a connective tissue is defined as a tissue where there are very sparsely spaced cells. These are the we call fibroblast cells scattered through this dermis and then some melanocyte cells, these dark ones. And these loosely packed cells that are not going to have direct connections with each other are going to secrete something called a ground substance, some kind of matrix that they're going to be embedded in. And in the case of the dermis, this matrix is going to consist primarily of collagen and elastin protein fibers. So these protein fibers are secreted by the living cells, but they are not themselves living tissue. So we've got sparsely spaced cells, no direct contact with each other, that are going to secrete this ground substance. So within this connective tissue, within this dermis, we're also going to find basically all the stuff that keeps living cells alive in, in large bodied animals. So we're going to find the blood vessels, the nerves. We're also going to find smooth muscle here within the dermis. So let's take a closer look at the functions of each of these layers. And we're going to look at this example of fish skin. This is basically the same image that we've been looking at. The function of the dermis is primarily to be a very tough layer. So all of these collagen fibers have very great tensile strength. So pulling strength, they're not going to break very easily when you pull on them. And the elastin is as it sounds, a, an elastic tissue that's going to tend to restore the original shape when it's stretched. So the dermis is going to play a big role in maintaining the contours and the shape of the body. The job of the epidermis is pretty much to be expendable and die. So this is the layer that protect, protects against abrasion and other kinds of scraping and things like that in the environment. And it does this by just sloughing off and being replaced. So these cells are going to be replaced in this very bottom most layer of cells. And this is called the stratum germinativum. So there's a membrane that separates the dermis from the epidermis called the basal lamina, and directly adjacent to that basal lamina is the stratum germinativum. This is the layer of actively dividing cells. This is where all of the regeneration of that epidermis, this constant generation of these kamikaze cells whose job is basically to die. <laughs> and so in the case of fish skin, these epidermal cells are helped in this job by a layer of mucus that covers the skin that's going to also help um, protect against microbial infection and also this abrasion. And so there will be many of these unicellular mucus glands in the cells of the fish. But then also this layer of epidermis and when this top layer is abraded away or scraped or it's just time for it to be sloughed off, it's going to die a form of cell death called necrosis, or we can think of this as disorganized cell death. It's just going to open up that cell membrane and the cell contents will just be sort of spewed to the environment and that cell will just kind of be sloughed off in this very kind of uh, disorganized way. It's just going to kind of explode and spew its contents to the environment. So as this happens at the surface, these cells are constantly worn away. They're constantly being regenerated from the stratum germinativum, and they'll move upward toward the surface as more and more cells are generated beneath them. The main integumentary structure that we see in fish are scales. So these can be bony scales in the case of osteichthyes or the bony fish. Sharks have a distinct kind of scale called a placoid scale that resembles tiny little teeth all over the body. But these scales that you find in bony fish are primarily made up of a form of bone called dermal bone. We'll talk more in detail about what that means and how that forms when we get to the skeletal system. But basically inside each of these little flaps there is a bony scale made of made of dermal bone that's going to be covered over by a layer of dermis and then this layer of epidermis. 
in this shingle-like way. So this is an example of something called a cycloid scale. You'll see detailed descriptions of many different kinds of scales in the book, um, but they're all going to serve a similar function and be formed of similar components. So what you see here is this part labeled the exposed part. These are the little shingle-like things that you see actually on the surface of a fish. The rest of these the scale is going to be embedded in the skin and this is going to give the skin additional protection against mechanical damage by forming this kind of bony outer shell. So let's take a closer look at how these scales develop. And so what we're going to see here is in the development of scales there's going to be this intricate interplay between the dermis and the epidermis, the mesodermally derived tissue and the ectodermally derived tissue. And it's going to start with the formation of something called a dermal papilla, also known as a mesenchymal papilla, that's going to accumulate right here, right under the layer of the epidermis, and it's going to sort of push the epidermis up and grow up and form a little bump underneath the epidermis. So as it does this, this papilla is going to start releasing signaling chemicals, sort of like what we saw in the case of dorsal development, these signaling molecules, that's going to cause the overlying epidermal cells to differentiate into specialized cells called ameloblasts. So once these have differentiated into ameloblasts, they are then going to start sending their own signal downward toward this dermally derived uh, papilla tissue that's going to send them a signal to differentiate into specialized cells called odontoblasts. So we're going to have this mutual induction. Once those epidermal cells turn into ameloblasts, then they're going to send the signal to the underlying cells to form odontoblasts. So, these ameloblasts are going to start secreting a substance called enamel downward toward the dermal layer. So they're going to deposit enamel. These odontoblasts are going to start secreting a substance called dentine upward toward the surface. And as these layers of enamel and dentine accumulate right adjacent to each other, the structure, the scale, is going to be pushing up toward the surface and eventually flatten out and sort of lie down over the surface of the skin. So it's going to have this dermal center that's going to lay down the, the bone that forms the center of it, a layer of dentine, a layer of enamel, and that's going to form that bony scale. So it turns out that this process of development is identical to the process by which teeth develop. And so this eruption of this enamel and dentine structure is basically what happens in teeth. And it turns out that teeth are also integumentary structures that are evolutionarily derived from bony scales around the edge of the mouth that were useful in forming teeth to be able to grab prey. And so these are basically homologous structures, these bony scales and teeth. Another structure that we see in fish that's derived from this dermal bone are basically the bony fin rays that we see forming the fins of all of the actinopterygian fish. The, the ray finned fish are going to have these structures called lepidotrichia, these bony fin rays that are also derived from dermal bone forming within the skin. And so fin, basically the fins of fish are also integumentary structures. Now let's take a look at our first major evolutionary transition, that transition from an aquatic environment to life on land. So again, this is going to be huge for the skin. It's going to be a very different environment. So there's going to be a major functional shift in what the skin is doing, and it's going to have a big job in preventing desiccation or drying out of the body. So what we're going to see is this morphological innovation, the formation of the stratum corneum, or this keratinized layer of skin at the outer surface. So let's first take a look at the skin in frogs. So if we think about this stratum germinativum, it's actively dividing and pushing cells ever, ever upward toward the surface. And as these cells move upward through these layers of the skin, 
they are depositing the substance keratin. So keratin is only produced by these epidermal cells. They're sometimes also known as keratinocytes, so keratin uh, synthesizing cells. So these keratinocytes are filling these cells gradually more and more and more as they go through these, move upward through these layers of the skin until when they get up into this layer, the stratum corneum, they their cell organelles have been completely replaced by keratin. So you still have the external structure of the cell. The cell itself is intact, but instead of being filled with living stuff, organelles, it's filled just with keratin. And so this is a different form of cell death. This is called apoptosis, or programmed cell death, or organized cell death. So we're going to kill off these cells in a functional way that, that serves some kind of purpose, in this case being a fairly waterproof and fairly hardened, tough layer of dead cells covering the outside of the body. So this is a novelty, an evolutionary novelty of the tetrapods. Fish do not have this layer called the stratum corneum, or this heavily uh, cornified outer surface. Another big change that we see going from fish to tetrapods is these glands in the skin, rather than being just made up of one cell, we start to see multicellular glands. So these are going to be glands that can actually store up the secreted materials that they're going to release into these storage chambers and release these materials in very large quantities. So if you think of amphibians in particular, one of the functions of their skin is that they're going to be doing some of their respiratory exchange through the skin, taking up oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. To be able to do that, that skin has to be kept always moist. Those gases are going to dissolve in liquid before they can be absorbed. And so all of these mucus glands that you see in the skin of a frog are basically have the purpose of keeping that skin always moist for the purpose of that respiratory exchange. Also, because they're exchanging respiratory gases through the skin, this layer of stratum corneum has to be relatively thin. So we're going to have a very thin, cornified layer. We also see in frogs other kinds of multicellular glands that contain things such as toxins, poisons, protective chemicals, and these can be in very, very large multicellular glands to be stored up and deployed as needed. When we come to amniotes, remember the big story with amniotes is this further liberation from the water. So amniotes have this innovation of containing their embryos within a shelled egg so that they don't have to lay their eggs in water, and their skin is also going to show signs of that further liberation from water. So what we're going to see is an increased thickening of that stratum corneum. They're going to have a much thicker, hardened, waterproof layer on the outside of their skin as compared to amphibians. Remember who needed to keep that thin for respiratory exchange. We're also going to see in amniotes a lot of keratinized scales or plates. So these scales are very different from the scales we saw in fish. These are going to be hardened by keratin rather than being bony scales, and we'll take a closer look in a moment at how these kinds of scales develop. We also see in amniotes the near universal presence of claws at the ends of the digits. So there are a couple of species of frogs that have some claws, but nearly all amniotes that have toes have some form of claw, nail, something derived from claws. So let's first take a look at the development of these keratin scales. So these keratin scales are going to also begin their development as a dermal papilla that's going to sort of push up into this layer of epidermis and form kind of a bump in the epidermis. So this bump is going to continue to grow up and sort of flatten out until it forms a scale that has a layer of very, very hardened keratin in the epidermis. So it's going to have a very thick, we call horny scale. We call things a horny basically because um, the horns of uh, things like cattle are composed of keratin, and so these are a similar material that makes up 
the horn. So we saw the teeth of lampreys described as horny for the same reason. They're made of keratin. So this very hardened region, and it's also going to contain this dermal core on the inside from this dermal papilla that kind of pushed up into the epidermis to form the scale. There's also going to be a region in between these scale structures that is softer and more flexible, and we call this the hinge region. This allows the individual scales to have some mobility. So again, we've got the dermis underlying kind of pushing up into each of these scales, and then layers of epidermis, a living layer, a non-living, thickened non-living, keratinized layer. So this is an example of lipidosaur skin. Remember, lipidosaurs are snakes, lizards, and the tuatara. And lipidosaur skin has something a little unusual that it does. Because these scales are so hardened, to be able to grow, they need to slough them off and form new ones to be able to increase in body size. These hardened scales do not actually grow. So this entire process is going to rely on basically repeating layers of the skin, duplicating them into an outer epidermal generation and an inner epidermal generation, and these are going to be separated by something called a fission zone. So the stratum germinativum is going to underlie both of these two layers, it's not going to be repeated, and the stratum corneum is going to be limited to the outside of the outer epidermal generation. And in this process called ecdysis, or shedding of the skin, these layers are just going to separate from each other. So here you have, there's going to be a resting period in between sheds, this duplication period, the renewal, where these different layers are going to be uh, duplicated into an inner and outer generation, and then that outer generation is going to be shed and sloughed off, and then you go into another rest period after that shedding. So lizards will do this generally um, in patches, kind of similar to what you see here, but snakes shed their skin all at once in one long piece, and it's sort of like turning a sock inside out and pulling the sock off so the skin, the shed skin of the snake you find is actually inside out. We continue to see dermal bone in amniotes even though their scales are made of keratin. They don't have these dermal scales but they use dermal bone in different ways. So one of the ways that dermal bone appears in amniotes are in structures called osteoderms. So these are small bony plates in the skin. So we'll see a couple of examples this down here with the black and orange is the skin of a Gila monster, and these little dots are little bits of bone that help to protect that skin. So we see it also um, underlying the, the hardened keratin in our, things like armadillos and pangolins that kind of roll up into balls and protect themselves with these hardened layers of osteoderms. We also see structures called gastralia. So you can think of these as being kind of like abdominal ribs. These are rib-like structures that form in the belly side, the ventrolateral body wall. And we see gastralia in crocodilians primarily. They also make up part of the lower shell or the plastron of turtles. Turtles also incorporate dermal bone in the uh, upper shell or the carapace. So the turtle shell is made up of a layer of dermal bone with keratin scales on top of it. So these scales that you're seeing are the keratinized scales and then underneath that is the dermal bone and hopefully you took a good look at the turtle shell in lab and saw that dermal bone lining the inside of the turtle shell. We also see dermal bone in these bony plates that run along the backs of crocodilians. So again, these are keratin scales that are covering the bony plates, but underneath them are these bony structures called scutes that give extra strength uh, to the skin of a crocodilian. And we'll see when we get to the cranial skeleton, but also we see dermal bone in the skulls of pretty much all vertebrates. Dermal bone makes up most of the skull region that you're seeing here, most of the, and the face is all this dermal bone that develops and is derived from 
tissues in the skin. So we'll see much more about how that works when we get to the skeletal system. So now let's move on to birds. So the two major integumentary structures that we see in birds that are new are, of course, feathers and beaks are keratin structures. Those are integumentary structures that form around the mouth and replace the heavy bony teeth in birds. So birds also continue to have keratin scales on their legs and feet, similar to what we see in the, in the reptiles, reptiles in quotes. So feathers can come in different forms and shapes. So this is an example of a contour feather. This is actually a flight feather. You can tell because of the asymmetrical veins, one of them much larger than the other. The body feathers would look similar to this, only both sides of the vein would be symmetrical. We also have down feathers. These are generally found underneath the contour feathers. They're kind of fluffy. Uh, feathers that are used to keep the bird warm. And then we also have these feather structures called phyloplumes that are, uh, they can be sensory structures, for example, around the beak of, of birds um, that form these little filaments. So the parts of a feather, there's a central shaft that goes through the center of the feather. The part of it that does not bear the vein is called the calamus. So this is the part of the shaft that is below where these these vein filaments come off. The part of the shaft that bears the vein is called the rachis, so the rest of this shaft coming up and supporting the whole feather. The vein is composed of a number of barbs, so each of these little lines that you see here is a barb. This is a close-up of one. These black lines are the same as these black lines here. And each of these barbs have their own little filaments coming off of them called barbules. And these barbules are going to hook together with the barbules of the adjacent vein. Let's take a closer look at how that works. So here are the barbules on one side. They have these little concave structures. And then the barbule on the other side has these structures called hooklets that hook into those little concave structures. This is remarkably like the way Velcro works. Um, so birds actually invented Velcro. So this is why when you're playing with a feather that you found and some of the vein has come apart, you can kind of zip it together with your fingers. And that's what birds are doing when they're preening their feathers. They're re-zipping these veins together. They're re-zipping these, these barbs together by attaching these barbules one to another. So these are the hooklets on the barbules. The barbules are lined up all on these barbs. So let's take a look at how these feathers develop. So the feathers begin just like what we saw in the keratin scale in the lepidosaur with a dermal papilla, a little bump of the dermis that pushes up into the epidermis. So around this collar region, at the base of this bump, we start to have what we call a patterning region that's going to start to form these barbs around the edge of it. And as it forms, it's forming in this cylindrical structure where these barbs are coming up, growing out of this collar region, this patterning region, and forming up from this collar as a cylinder. So what we see later on in development the feather is forming in the cylindrical structure within a sheath. The barbs are kind of held together in the cylinder uh, within the sheath. It's forming underneath this sheath. So after this has grown out a little bit, what happens is that this whole structure, this whole cylinder, cylindrical structure, is going to sink down into the dermis to form the feather follicle. So if you can imagine Think of it as sort of like a mountain that just right around the base, the whole thing just kind of sinks in and drops down into the earth, and then the mountain keeps forming up out of this hole. So here we see there's this layer of epidermis that comes down and around and surrounds the whole thing in two layers because of the way it's just sunken in to the dermis, and then there continues to be this dermal core within the inside of the feather 
That's the remnants of this dermal papilla once it's sunk back down into the dermis. So again, we've got these two layers of epidermis surrounding this dermal pulp cavity. And then as this feather continues to grow up out of this feather follicle, once it's completed its development, that sheath is going to crumble away. If any of you have ever had a pet parrot or other pet birds, these are those pin feathers that grow out when the feather is repl being replaced and that outside of the pin feather kind of crumbles off and then the feather kind of unfurls from within that and takes on its shape. So this is kind of what this looks like. Here we have the feather follicle, the feather growing up out of it. This pulp cavity is protected by these structures called pulp caps and it's going to grow in successive generations. Uh, once this new pulp cap is completed, the old one is going to be shed away so that this pulp cavity is going to be continuing to grow into the base of the feather. This is the that sheath that's derived from epidermis and as the feather opens up and unfolds, the sheath is shed away and crumbled away. So again, if we look at a cross section down here through the Feather follicle, what we see is, um, this is going to be all surrounded by dermis, a layer of epidermis, kind of a space, another layer of epidermis, and this shaft of the feather is going to be forming right here in between that layer of epidermis that's going to become the sheath and this pulp cavity. So if we look a little bit further up into the shaft, we've got this sheath. We've got the vein that's kind of wrapped around the cylinder. We've got the layer of epidermis that is laying down the keratin and forming that vein. And then we've got this dermal core on the inside if we're looking at a layer down here. So again, if we were to look inside that sheath, this is kind of what we'd see. We'd see the cylindrical structure surrounded by a collar at the bottom. This is that patterning zone that's basically directing how these barbs are uh, constructed and patterned. The barbs are sort of wrapped around the cylindrical shape. The barbules are going to be forming in between them and interlocking. And then once that sheath comes off, this is just going to open up into the flat structure. So this is the part of the feather that developed earliest, going to the most recently developed parts of the feather down here at the base. So feathers are pretty complicated structures. Now let's take a look at integumentary structures in mammals. So the main integumentary structures that we see in mammals, the novel ones, are hair and mammary glands. But we also see an incredible diversity of other kinds of integumentary structures when it comes to mammals. So let's first take a look at the development of hair. So hair is going to develop in quite a different way, but with some similarities. So we're going to continue to have this close interaction between the dermis and the epidermis. So we're going to have a structure, a papilla structure form, but rather than it pushing up into the epidermis, the epidermis is going to grow down into the dermis. So it's going to push down and this little cap of dermis, this little dermal papilla is just going to be pushed down along with it. So again, this dermal papilla and the epidermis are sending signals to each other that are directing all of this development. And the epidermis continues to grow down. It's going to form the basic structures for laying down the keratin that forms the hair. So within this bulb, we're going to start to have keratinocytes or keratin producing cells that are going to form the hair. We also start to see the development of some glandular tissue within this epidermis and these are going to be the oil glands that are going to secrete oil and deposit it on the hairs to help protect and condition the hairs. And this is just going to grow down and down and down into the dermis forming a follicle. But remember this is just going to be lined by a, a single layer of epidermis that's pushed down rather than this kind of bump that grows up and then sinks back down into the dermis. And so the structure we end up with is again a follicle lined with epidermal cells that goes deep within the dermis. So because it's within the dermis it's going to become associated with 
uh, muscles. So these are called erector pili muscles. These are the muscles that allow mammals to, to raise the hairs to help keep warm. Dogs will also raise hairs on their back to try to look bigger in an aggressive type situation. So this is what you mean when you talk about getting your hackles up, you're taking an aggressive stance. These are also responsible for the formation of what we call goosebumps in people. These little bumps are basically the hairs being stood up when you get cold, basically in an attempt to create a thicker fur coat, only we don't have the fur anymore, but our bodies don't really know that. And so we also get them when we get scared because of that same response that we talked about in dogs, uh, that attempt to make us look bigger by increasing the size of our fur coat is also a response of these erector pili muscles that will pull the hairs um, upward and cause them to stand on end. So here we see the sebaceous glands that are associated with the hair shaft that's going to deposit that oil uh, directly onto the hair follicle. Um, there are sweat glands both associated with the hairs and also um, independent of the hairs, so eccrine and apocrine sweat glands, don't worry about those terms at all. And then things like neurons, uh, sensory nerve cells associated with hairs are going to be located down here in the dermis as well. Now if we think about these mammary glands and how they develop in mammals, what we find is in pretty much all mammals, we see the development early in the embryology of a structure called a milk ridge, and it extends all the way from the axilla, which is another name for the armpit, all the way down through the thorax and abdomen along all the way to the groin. And so, as I'm sure you've noticed, different mammals have their mammary glands located in different regions here. And what happens is depending on the particular species, part of this milk ridge will degenerate and only the part that's actually used by the mammal will develop into these mammary glands. And so, uh, for example, in the case of bats, they have their mammary glands located in uh, the axilla or armpit. And so um, little baby bats kind of tuck their their noses into their mama's armpit to suckle. As we know, primates, such as ourselves, have pectoral mammary glands, so we're going to retain the part of the milk ridge in the chest region. Things like pigs and horses are going to have one or more mammary glands located along the abdomen, and so they're going to retain those while the rest of this milk ridge degenerates. So we have different forms of milk delivery systems in different kinds of mammals. So the very most primitive or ancestral type is basically just the mammary glands secreting that milk directly onto the surface of the body. It gets caught in hairs around them and the offspring will uh, sort of lap up the milk from off of those hairs. So we see this in things like monotremes, the egg-laying mammals like the platypus and the echidna that have very uh, ancestral, uh, very generalized forms of these mammary glands. In things like cows, we see an udder system where the milk is collected up and stored in the structure called a cistern. So all of the milk from all the different mammary glands are going to deposit here, and then there's going to be a single teat that's going to be the delivery system for the um, baby calf. And then, of course, things like primates, like ourselves, are going to have a structure called a nipple that the uh, young can suckle on, and the different mammary glands will have their own ducts that each uh, empty into this nipple. Now, if we think about some of these integumentary structures, we've already seen some of these, the dermal bone and the keratin scales that we see in some mammals, such as the pangolin, the armadillo, that are used to protect their bodies from predators. Uh, we see still the appearance of claws in many mammals, but then in others, these claws have been modified into structures such as hooves or fingernails, like in primates such as ourselves. In many species of hoofed animals, we see things like antlers and horns. So antlers are actually composed of dermal bone that grows out from the skull. So things like these antlers, any of the ones that are shed yearly, such as the antlers and moose, these are made of dermal bone. The horns that you see in 
bulls and buffalo and things like that are actually keratin structures and those are not ever shed. Those grow throughout the animal's life. If we think about the baleen in baleen whales, so this is a keratin structure in the mouth that's used to strain very small particles of food out of the water. This is an integumentary structure made of keratin. So all of these keratin structures are secreted by epidermal cells. Everything that's made of dermal bone forms within the dermal layer. So we've seen lots and lots of different kinds of integumentary structures that give this integument lots and lots of diverse functions within the lives of vertebrates.